Okay, right, now that's fine. Yes, well, thanks, Sean. Um, yes, yeah, so what we're in our double act we're going to do here is tell you a little bit about uh, monitoring the Gary restoration project. Um, this is a, a joint initiative between SEPA, SSE and ourselves. Um, and I would say that as far as the fish is concerned, it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, so what you're going to see here today is just some preliminary findings, really. Um, and that will become apparent as we go on. Anyway, next one. So just a, a bit of background. This is the River Gary. Um, in fact, there's a wee kind of animation here. You'll have to flick through, Sean. Um, it was um, obviously it was abstracted. If you can flick through the next one. Uh, so water was abstracted off the, this place, a bit called Gary intake into Loch Erichte, uh, plus also a number of tributaries along the side. Yeah, next one, keep going. Uh, and some side tributaries. And, and so basically for 13 kilometres, um, the river used to be dry. Uh, there were no salmon and likewise in the tributary called the, the Alt Glass Core, uh, the glass curry there. Um, the, yeah, that was these these tributaries were dry too. Yeah, next one. Yeah, keep going. So um, up to 2017, the river used to be dry uh, below Gary intake, um, but then in 2017, um, after a long process, flow was restored. Um, well, well, our flow was restored. It's not a full normal flow. It's still a, you know, basically a drought flow, a Q96. Um, but obviously what we were keen to do is then to see the salmon population uh, restored. Next, please. But uh, there were a few issues to, to consider. Uh, firstly, there had been a weir down at Struan near the House of Brewer um, that SSE had, had removed at the beginning of the project. Um, so prior to that, salmon couldn't get up, uh, but salmon now could. However, just upstream of Struan, um, there are, well, at roundabout Struan, there are a number of waterfalls that historically salmon had to jump. And one of the things I was particularly concerned about, because we didn't, still didn't have a proper natural flow, would salmon actually be able to get up these falls? And if they didn't, um, you know, it might take us quite a while to decide uh, that it couldn't get up. And if they didn't get up, it would be very embarrassing. Um, so what we really needed to do was to generate a salmon population to ensure that there were fish coming back in order to test these falls to see that fish could get up it. Next, please. So what we did was uh, we decided to stock the river um, and we used I'd over from reconditioned kelts um, from what is now our hatchery down at Almond Bank, um, derived from local tributaries. Um, bear in mind, there was no fish to start with. Um, so we, the idea was to stock in Idova, but because we were part of the, the plan that's been agreed, um, is that we want to obviously determine whether wild fish are actually spawning, are fish getting back. So we needed a method um, of the, be, being able to tell wild, wild juveniles from stock juveniles. And Victoria explained a lot about the process yesterday. So basically what happens is, is this is in conjunction with UHI, that each fish, as they're stripped, um, some tissue is taken so that all the DNA, all the, the adults in the hatchery are genetically profiled. And then in the autumn, what we then do is we collect, as Victoria said, six or 700 samples from juveniles. And basically what we did when we set this up, we didn't know what we were going to find, that we uh, split the river up and effectively to find these juveniles, we just go through and pick a fish at run. Well, fish out a fish every 15 meters, take a clip, fin clip um, and then move on. So basically what we're trying to do is to get a picture across a whole length of river um, and then 
to determine whether the fish there are stocked or, or whether they're not, which we then assume uh, means they're wild. Next, please. Um, in addition to water in the Gari, um, another complicating factor, well, an issue was that on the side tributary, tributary called the Glasgary, um, a flow was restored there too. However, at the hydro intake, there was no way in which salmon could get above uh, the weir back to their historical spawning areas. So what was agreed there was a small screen was installed in the intake weir and upstream of that intake weir in the top of the Glasgary, um, it was agreed that we could stock that basically as mitigation stocking, a bit like what they do on, on the Conan. So this was all part uh, of this scheme. It's all being monitored. Next, please. So they are just to let you see um, the blue bits are the, um, so it, well, uh, is unstocked. Um, the river part of the Gary and the bottom of the Glasgary. Um, but it was decided that we were not going to stock the whole length of the river. Um, at the beginning in 2017, when flow was restored, actually some salmon were seen up to a point, up to a small fall, sort of round about down the main lodge. And it was decided that stocking would only be concentrated at the very top end of the river and in the lower part of the Glasgary. Uh, so in effect, what we've got there is two areas that are subject to temporary restoration stocking until such time as a wild population is shown to recover, and also an area of mitigation stocking, which would continue perpetually further upstream. Right, next, please. So what we also did, and Ian asked some questions about this yesterday to Victoria, is in addition to this blanket sampling um, to basically determine whether or wild or stock fish there, what we obviously wanted to do is to get some quantitative feel for the fish uh, population. So over something like 10 sites between the bottom of the river and up in the, the Glasgary, um, we've established a sequence of quantitative triple shot electric fishing sites that are run every year. So that's a separate electric fishing program uh, to actually give numbers. Next, please. So I'm not going to dwell a lot on this, but from 2017, that was the year before. Uh, well, the, these would have been fish from the year before. Um, I should say that in some of the sites you'll see there were some fish, and that's because even in the years before the water was restored, we did stock in some some Idova for a few years beforehand, even though there was very little water. Um, but in the years, I say, since uh, the, the stocking program has got really got going in 2018, um, and with the flow, you can see as far as salmon fry are concerned, that most sites has been a, a really very significant increase since 2017. And I should say here that the sites that say from Gary Schoolhouse rightwards, all of these sites are in the sort of stocking zone, whereas the Dalnamin and Clunes are below the stocking zone uh, and Struan is below even the falls. Uh, so you can see there that the bits that have been stocked, generally speaking, especially the three Gary sites, Schoolhouse, Dalna Cardiff and Eden and Confluence, those three sites have really, the, the, the fry density has really, really leapt in the stocking areas. Um, it's not quite as good further down. Next, please. And likewise with salmon par. So particularly in the stocked areas, um, the core stocked areas, we're really seeing um, a lot more salmon, you know, really good numbers of salmon par now. Next, please. And another interesting thing that we found is that, um, and I've just picked here the schoolhouse site, which is at, basically at the bottom of the stocked area. It's a, a quite a prolific site, but you can see from the start that initially there were only two age classes of fish um, and the fry were quite big. 
Um, and as time has gone on, basically the growth rates have gone down and we're now really into sort of three year old territory. So effectively, the, 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 with multiple year classes present, um, we've effectively got this thing right at carrying capacity, I would imagine. Next, please. So, yes, uh, the question then, um, we know that there are fish in there. What are they? So we started collecting these data, um, the, the genetic stuff, by, samples back in 2018. Now, unfortunately, uh, despite the initial intentions, um, it took us it took a, a few years before UHI were able to actually start supplying uh, results from the first year. So there's been something of a backlog. Uh, so at the start, we were collecting data, uh, but we we didn't have any results for a while. So we weren't really able to sort of modify our, our sampling program based on what we were finding. We were just having to take pot luck in some ways and, and as to how we had devised the sampling program. But anyway, uh, what you find there is that um, for the three years that we have data, what I've tried to do on the basis of data from nearby sites, uh, I've tried to amend the quantitative stocking data based on the proportion of wild and stock fish in the area. So if you look at everything west of the blue line in the three years in 2018, 19 and 20, everything west of the blue line is basically in the Gary. These are all the core stocked areas and all the fish there, the analysis is telling us, are stocked. So these are all stocked fish, uh, stock fry. Uh, whereas once you get downstream, um, you can see it's more of a mixed bag. Now in 20, 20, 2018, the first year, we found that actually there was quite a reasonable number of wild fish with very little signs of dispersal. Um, then curiously in 2019, we had very few wild fish um, and greater evidence of dispersal uh, from above, from the stocked ones. That is. And, uh, and in 2020, it's sort of more, more of a mixed bag. And then curiously, even down at Struan, which is below the falls, um, you know, we're actually seeing some uh, stock fish winding up there too. However, part of the reason for this, I would suggest in 2019, the reason for so few wilds there is probably because there was a drought, obviously in 2018, fish might have difficulty getting up, but also our previous electric fishing would suggest that there was not many adults likely to come back in that year from previous limited stockings. But anyway, it's uh, as far as this is concerned, it does show that the stocking very much works. Um, and with a very limited number of returning adults, we are generally seeing some fish getting over the falls. Now, since then, um, Mike and the team have actually seen adult salmon further up, but these data are still in the process of being produced by, by UHI. Uh, next one. Next one, Sean. So, uh, uh, we'll go one back, please. So, one of the things that uh, it jumps out from that previous um, previous slide was that there's clearly di some degree of dispersal of fish coming out um, of the stock reach. And when we set up the project, we really we weren't we didn't think about movements. All all we really wanted to do was to determine whether there are wild fish there. So the sampling design, um, as I say, I wasn't a huge amount of thought went into it for a start because we didn't know what we were going to expect. expect. But one of the things that's come out of this, um, and it does need some modification, I think, is that it's quite clear that there's actually this technique is very useful in showing interesting movement of fish. So, for example, just as a, a simple thing, we had been I had 
split the river up into a number of basically sampling zones, um, basically areas that you could fish in a day more or less, uh, where we 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 sampled the the fry for fin clips, and you can see them there. So what I then did just I'm, I, this is literally just work in progress. I've just been doodling with this recently since I got data from Victoria, but it's quite fascinating. Next one. So th this is just something I've just been looking at for, for the first look just the, the last few weeks. Um, but when we started um, at the beginning in 2018 with the stocking, uh, our, our sort of record keeping maybe wasn't uh, as good as it, it could have been. We, we'll say we, we, we had no intention. We didn't think it. we were going to use it for this purpose. But what, what it did for a start was we know that we stocked fry, we stocked eggs out in particular areas. Now, at the beginning, I, I couldn't say exactly which section they were in, but we know that some fish were stocked in the main river, either between Gary Section 8 and Gary Section 12, and some were stocked in the Glasgow and Deer tributary. Um, so what this this um, graph shows basically are is each site. Now, if you just take the Gary ones for a start, you could say, right, um, we stocked in the red area. And if you look at the, the shading on the, the graph there, you can see that clearly um, you, you can see where the different sets of fish were stocked. Because basically, so each square, each, each um, column represents the offspring of one female. Um, this is so it's the offspring of one female. And so what you've got there is that quite a lot of the, the juvenile, the fry in the first summer are clearly hanging about probably the areas they were stocked. But you can actually see that there is a degree of dispersal downstream. And interesting also from the glass curry, you're actually seeing some fish that have dispersed down into the main river Gary itself. But as I say, in the first year, we, o we were only interested in sampling fry because that's all we wanted to do. But in the second year, we thought, well, this is quite interesting because there was an area of the river where we, we, fi we figured that wild fish were spawning, but we were seeing relatively few juveniles. So we were keen just to have a look at par in the next year. And in retrospect, you know, it would have been good to have sampled par over the whole length of all the sites, but we, we didn't have enough resource to do that. But we concentrated on the sort of basically from the Andy or tributary down. Um, and you can see there that there's actually quite a significant increase in the amount of dispersal uh, to the par stage. And indeed, from the tributary, you know, you, we've actually got um, par from the tributary turning up all the way down at section two, down at Clunes Lodge. Um, so I think in extreme, we've got some fish that have maybe travelled something like 11 kilometres in extreme. Um, now, this is the sort of thing that we all expect to happen, um, but it's the sort of thing that without this sort of tagging, this technique, you can't really demonstrate on, on these fish. So we're kind of moving on a bit from the, the initial objectives of the process, project, but I think it's something that I think we would all feel would be interesting. Next, please. And likewise, the following year, um, since then, we, we're, we're homing in in more detail as to where the eggs are actually planted. But you can see the same thing again. Um, although that year, because we were doing par, we didn't actually sample juveniles in the Glasgow itself um, in order to be able to do par in the main stem. Um, but basically, you know, this thing has thrown up a, a lot of questions and uh, what we will be doing or are doing is trying to devise a, a sort of better sampling strategy to capture some of this information. I say it's just unfortunate that um, it took several years to get some info back um, at, the, at the beginning. Anyway, uh, but that's, that's a, a sort of an interesting aside. So anyway, next one, Sean. So the conclusion so far, I would say that firstly, 
stocking with eye reconditioned kelt ova is indeed capable of generating natural carrying capacity densities. Um, and there's this very interesting movement of juvenile salmon over the Rin River lives. And that's actually, true. I didn't show it here, but it's true of wild fish too. Next one. And uh, I could also say that up to the 2019 spawning, there's been modest numbers of wild adults over the falls and spawned in the lower half of the river. But now that we've got in, you know, the small production has come increased from really from now on, we should expect to see a lot more fish back. Um, and in the next few years, you know, the thing should uh, we should prove conclusively um, one way or another. Next, please. And anyway, just thanks to Mike Brown and Craig Duncan and the Hatchery and all our team, because it's they, they are the ones that are going out there and collecting all this data. And Eric Victoria and the team at UHI uh, for doing the processing work. And of course, SEPA and SSE, who, without whose generosity and funding this stuff, it, it wouldn't happen. Right, that's me. Great, now, great. thanks very much, David. So I'll pass over to Alistair Matheson from SEPA now. Um, I'll just bring it up. Thank you.